be seated. We're back on the record. Are you ready to have the jury brought back in? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. State ready? Yes, Okay, let's bring the jury back in. Please be seated. Mr. O'Berry, you may continue. Four minutes. That felt like a long time to you before we took the break that we sat here and did nothing for four minutes. You get to think what Trayvon Martin was doing. You get to try and figure out why when he said, George said, at 7.11.40, he's running. Seven fifteen forty three, when Rachel Gentel tells you the phone call ended because of a bump. Four minutes. To do what? To walk home? To run home? Four minute mile was broken when I was like 12 by somebody. And I think he was in his teens. Don't know if he played football. Don't know if he was a defensive guy on a football team, but I do know that you can run a mile in about four minutes if you're in decent shape. So we know that with the opportunity to go home that he did not. We know that because of the football throw away. So let's talk about factual innocence of my client that I'm going to finally leave this behind. I want to talk about factual innocence. Somebody decided that they were angry. Somebody decided they were ticked off. Maybe somebody decided that they just had ill will, spite, or hatred. For whatever reason, somebody did decide that it wasn't over with the running. Because it wasn't, after all. It had only just begun, right? Isn't that really what happened here? It wasn't some cop wannabe. It wasn't some I've learned about how to talk about self-defense, and oh my god, he forgot to say I have to stand your ground on Hannity. Let's convict him. He didn't tell Hannity I've heard about stand your ground. The person who decided that this is going to continue, that it was going to become a violent event, was the guy who didn't go home when he had the chance to. It was the guy who decided to lie in wait, I guess, plan his move, it seems, decide what he was going to do, and when. The state told you that he had no decisions? They dared to tell you that Trayvon Martin had no decisions, that my client planned this? Really, four minutes. Four minutes of planning. And they want you to ignore it. I guess, because if you don't ignore that, factual and undeniable, innocence because with those four minutes now let's use your common sense now let's decide what probably happened that night because we know the result now let's try and figure out the why 
George Zimmerman probably heading back to his car, looking with his little baby flashlight for Trayvon Martin a little bit. Maybe. Maybe. Not proven, but maybe. Trayvon Martin, four minutes, doing something. And we don't know. We really don't. We know he's on the phone. We know he's talking. We know what Rachel Gentel said he was saying about whatever he called him. And I don't care that he called him some stupid name. He's 17 years old. They get to talk stupidly if they want. I'm OK with that. And I'm OK with Rachel Gentel being 16 or 18 or whatever. Who cares? She didn't want to be involved in this case. But the reality of what happened is very straightforward. And it proves absolute innocence. Of course, for four minutes, Trayvon wanted to do something that led to his confronting George Zimmerman. That, I would suggest, not because George Zimmerman said it. Throw out everything George Zimmerman said. Just forget it for a minute. Just, it didn't exist. He did what I probably would have told him to do if he called me on the 26th that night. Shut up. And don't say a word to law enforcement. I'll see you there in half an hour. Would have thrown on a pair of jeans, said goodbye to my wife, and run out the door to go see a potential new client. And I would have said, no, no, no. You are not talking to law enforcement. Particularly not looking like you look, and particularly not having just shot somebody, and I don't know anything about it, so hush up. And now, tell me. So let's just make believe that happened. Let's just take all of his self-serving, cop wannabe created statements and throw them out. What do we have? You've seen the picture a lot. You're going to see it again. What we do have, and thank God for Jenna Lauer, because when Mike Wagner went to her, can you pick out the guy, the potential shooter? She said, no. Go get me a picture. And I'll look at the picture. But somebody who shot somebody, I don't want to go say, I know who that is. So we have this. Interestingly, and thankfully, we have this, because if we didn't have this, we would only have the cleaned up photo, the one that doesn't show the significant injury. You know what I'm talking about. The one that says, you know, the nose is sort of back in shape. I don't know who put the nose back in shape. I don't know how it happened. But I do know it did look like that right afterwards. So if Mr. Zimmerman just created all of his statements and we throw them out, we start with this. Because this is undeniable. This is significant injury. And then we have the back of his head, and you know all about that already. And what else do we have? We have 40 seconds of screaming. When I first got this case, I thought it was going to come and go in 20 minutes. Because when I found out that there was a 911 call with somebody screaming on it, it was game over. Figure out who it is, and then we're done. Because the alternatives are it's Trayvon Martin screaming, and my guy is some horrible, extended, torturing, <clears throat> then eventual murderer for 45 seconds, something, if it was Trayvon Martin, something strange was happening for it to be him, some, some bizarre 45 second event where he would scream for help, yet still be able to batter George Zimmerman, but they'll have their theory. I guess they're gonna tell it to you in the final closing. Um, or it was George Zimmerman. And if I could get this to whoever, FBI, let's say, do a little comparison, and we're done. You heard from Dr. Nakasone, unfortunately, it couldn't be done. So now we don't know. Now, as Mr. Deloriano suggested, now you do get to decide, I guess, or not, of course, or not. You just simply get to decide that you can't decide. And then who gets the benefit of that? Mr. Zimmerman. So let's not forget about that standard as I'm wandering you down my little make-believe path of factual innocence. Then what else do we have? We have his initial immediate statement to Mr. Manalo and the way he looked. Salmamora, 
looked like he was beat up. Oh no, he looked like he was bending over. Manalo looked like he was beat up and he just looked strange. And then of course, as Mr. Delarana said, oh, just tell her I killed the guy. You see, not what he said at all. I think what he said, and use your own memories, was then when Mr. Manalo took the phone because he had to drop it because Tim Smith was doing what he does as a trained law enforcement officer and said, hands out, on top of your head, behind your back, where's the gun? Drops the phone, Manalo gets it, and says, words to the, the effect, your husband's been involved in the shooting. And what's the response from George Zimmerman? Tell him I shot somebody. I guess what he should have said, and what he was thinking through, and what he wasn't thinking through, and whatever he was going through, whatever the injuries were, whatever, as um, Manalo said, he just looked like he was out of breath. He should have said, well, that may sound insensitive a year and a half from now. I should have said that I had to shoot somebody. I don't know what he should have said. He told his wife he wasn't the one shot. Unusual, inappropriate. Somebody calls up and says, honey, I was just involved in a car accident. What's your first response? Are you okay? You don't even say, is the other person okay? Right? You just, it's just not natural. Are you okay? <coughs> you ever say, oh, well, is the car okay? No. You do what you know. You do what you deal with on a daily basis. Don't tell them I'm involved in a shooting. Oh, I shot somebody. So, we have that evidence. We have Smith, who says right away he told him he was screaming for help twice. Then we go forward, we have the medical personnel. The going, screaming for help is fun, because here, now the state wants you to say, this mastermind criminal, this guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, second degree murderer knew at that precise moment that he darn well better say that he was the one screaming. Because after all, he had killed the guy who was screaming in the state's theory, right? So he knew he took away care of that problem. Real problem with that theory? Unless the mastermind knew when Singleton mentioned in an um, interview that Trayvon Martin had passed, George was affected. I guess it could be part of the mastermind criminal behavior that he learned in, co in community college. I guess it could have been. But let me tell you, if you have a doubt as to whether or not that's true, you need to tell the state, don't ever come back before us again with a case like this. Don't ever do this to us. Because what we really have is what I said a while ago. We have factual innocence. You could go back there right now, look at the facts of this case, and say, we're going to flip the standard upside down. We're not going to allow Mr. O'Mara to get an acquittal for his client simply because the state hasn't proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt. We're only going to allow Mr. O'Mara to get his acquittal if he proves to us beyond a reasonable doubt that his client is innocent. And you could, because he is. Because he acted in self-defense. Not the standard, of course. So let's talk about the standard to see how far it feels from that very standard that the state is supposed to take on what they actually have accomplished. I'm going to first spend a moment on the witnesses. It's real quick, I'm going to get through it as quickly as I can. There's like 50 of them, um, and I could have the lights dim just a bit, Your Honor, and hopefully this will work. Chad Joseph, I'm just going to go through them. Didn't have much to say. He could throw it about a football field, but that's it. Did you know him to be? the sort of stepson of Trayvon Martin. Andrew Gaw, 5'10". That's important, and we're going to get to that in a second. You saw, you saw him stand next to me, and I did that on purpose to show you that I'm a few inches bigger than he is. And he was 5'10", in the shoes he had on that day. All he really said, didn't know much about that event, 
Sean Nofke, what did he say? Interestingly, because the first time that somebody was talking about talking to George was this guy. And what did he say? No anger, no animosity, no hatred, no anything in George's voice, might, quite matter of fact. A person who's trained, by the way, to deal with stressful situations and to understand and to dynamically interact with people on the other line, because sometimes these things turn serious quickly. And what did he say? Nope. He even, accept, he even accepted the reality that George may have un misunderstood when he said, which way is he running, that George Zimmerman may have thought, I should go find out. He acknowledged, maybe it was imprecise, <coughs> whatever. Next witness, Ramona Rumpf. She brought in the records custodian for the five calls. She also You'll see the affidavit, I think signed by her, of the sixth call. Listen to it if you want. Nothing to do with burglary, it's just George, B, George Zimmerman being George Zimmerman. Wendy Doraval, interesting witness. The lady who set up Neighborhood Watch a few months before because, as she said, they looked at the crime stats for that neighborhood and it was being assaulted by burglaries. And something needed to be done. So she went in and she did something. And she told us, you know, who might be suspicious from her experience and training. Remember, this is her love, not her job. She does this as a volunteer because she likes the idea of people being involved in the neighborhood and helping keep crime out of your own home and out of your neighborhood. Someone you don't know could be a reason for suspicion. A person walking in the areas they don't belong. Maybe. Someone walking in the rain without purpose. I don't want to just have you acquit my client because I can show you that Trayvon Martin did something bad, but I'm also not going to allow you or the state to ignore the realities of what actually happened that night. And describe Mrs. Zimmerman, to her knowledge, as meek. The other interesting thing about this cop wannabe They have this Citizens on Patrol program where you get a uniform, you get a car, little yellow lights on it. They can't be blue lights like we have for true law enforcement, but you get little yellow lights and you get to drive around and act like a cop. And he said to that opportunity, to be a cop wannabe in a cop uniform and a cop car with cop lights and probably a little cop computer in his car or at least a cop clipboard? No. Thanks, but no. I'm just, I got what I'm doing. I'm working, I'm going to school. Got my wife. I don't want your cop car. I don't want your lights. And I don't need your uniform. But this is the guy that the state is telling you, get ill will and hatred out of his cop wannabeism? Really? Seriously. Have they proven that to you? Have they come even close? Except for speculation? How many times did you hear an objection on the stand to speculation? Because well, we're not allowed to do that in court. Can't be a witness up there and say, what do you think? Maybe? Because it's not evidence. And that's why. It's not evidence for you. Because then you would go back there and go, well, John Doe speculated, and the judge allowed it. I guess we can speculate. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Donald O'Brien. HOA guy, parking committees, George helping with parking. Cop wannabe? I don't know. Doesn't seem if he doesn't want the cop car. Involved, citizen, sure. Any complaints, by the way, that the state brought to you about him just towing cars away, or ticketing people, knocking on, get your car off that yellow, anything like that to, to foster their argument to you that he was doing something wrong? Because remember, we've agreed not to assume. So where's the evidence? And they talked about the 17-year-old burglar getting caught and 
thank God the stucco guy caught him. And now George, I'm sorry, Mr. DeLeon just says to you that George Zimmerman was frustrated. Ooh, I, I wanted that one. Damn, darn, the, the stucco guy got him instead. Not gonna happen again. Are you kidding me? Are you actually kidding me that the state attorney's office representing the state is making that allegation to you? That that's ill will because somebody else caught a burglar? Okay, great, just tie it together, please. You got two dots and they're this far away. Just give me a line, give me something. Stucco guy caught him. George is frustrated. Anything in between besides speculation, assumption, or idiocy? Anything? Sergeant Romando, I, I would want him coming to a car accident that I was involved in. What a guy, what a cop. Did everything he could and did it without even thinking about it. Great cop, likes his job. Diana Smith, a little bit of just problems with the evidence, the rain, and we'll talk about that, but whether conditions wouldn't allow her to process the items, touch DNA could have been wiped away, and firearm not given to her. I don't know that it turns out to be a big deal, but there is a the lack of evidence here, and we'll talk about maybe why that's there. And who gets the benefit again of lack of evidence? George Zimmerman. Celine Bahador, you'll, be, you'll have an opportunity and the instructions will tell you, you assign credibility to witnesses. You decide what to believe and who to believe and whether or not they're credible. I would suggest that along the scheme as we're going, check out this woman's credibility before you accept what she said. You saw her, you heard her, you saw her review all of her statements as I show them to her. First time, talked to Mr. Dallariondo last week, first time in court, what shows up? Oh yeah, left to right. Well, here's a thought. Trayvon Martin was running from left to right when he came back towards the area where George Zimmerman was walking. There's a possibility, could have been. So, I don't know where she fits in, quite honestly. I don't know what she saw, if she saw, or how she saw it, or why she said it a year and a half into it, rather than any of her previous conversations with law enforcement or with me. But whatever, fit it in however you can. Jane Sudaika, you know, so she heard three pops. She lying? Oh my God, she's lying because she heard three pops. No, let's get off this lying thing because you have slight inconsistencies. She heard, or thought she heard, what she thought she heard. Okay, whatever, reverberations, fright, upset, who cares? She got it wrong. What else she got wrong was she thought the big guy was on top. And of course, um, or actually what she really thought was that Mr. Martin Trayvon Martin hadn't moved because she saw the whole thing, including the shot, which of course doesn't comport with a 911 call, but again, just stressful time for everybody. She seemed particularly affected by stress. Um, that he was on the ground, never moved, saw the shot, shot was from the top, shot was through the back, um, and that he never moved. It just doesn't make sense. It's okay. That vantage point that Mr. Root talked about, that movie, I don't know if any of you have ever seen it, but it's a great movie, because it really does. One event happens, it's the president getting shot by a marksman. And then there's eight different people, seven different people watching it. And everyone has a completely different story. They all view the same event, but they viewed it with their history, with their life experiences, what they were going through that day, and with what perspective they had. And it's just different, that's okay. That, it happens. Miss Manalo. She heard voices 20, 30 feet to the right. Seems to be consistent with it starting at the T intersection. Um, and of course, what she did was what we all do. And I'm not going to assail her for that. But what she did was make some assumptions based upon some facts that she saw afterwards. They're in evidence. It'll take me about five minutes to find them. 
Um, she was looking at pictures of Trayvon Martin when he was 12. I think she said that. So I'll tell you right now, um, if you looked at me when I was 12 um, and compared me to anybody, I'm the guy getting beat up. No questions asked. Um, but the reality is that she just had this vantage point of a child at 12 years old getting, I guess, the heck beat out of him by the other guy who was on TV, this big, heavy <coughs> picture of George Zimmerman. And she acknowledged, you know, now that you showed me the other picture, now here's the ones that I did look at and find out or think that it was Trayvon Martin being a small guy. Now that you show me these other pictures, I could have been wrong. Lying, perjury, no, no, come on. Just vantage point, just perspective. And then that's why you're here, because you get to figure it out. Rachel Gentel. Let me give you my perspective on Rachel Gentel. She didn't want to be involved in the case. She didn't want to be involved in the depositions. And she didn't want to be involved in trial. I think what happened, and this is just conjecture, and I'm not supposed to conjecture too much, I think her mom got with Ms. Fulton and said, go tell that lady what happened to her son. And she didn't really want to do that. Why she wrote the letter. That's why she didn't, she had or didn't have a conversation. I don't think she, don't forget, they had only reunited Trayvon Martin and Rachel Gentile like two weeks before. The phone records are in, and you know that. They knew each other um, from school, but never really hung out. Two or three weeks before was when they started talking again. So it wasn't what it was perceived to be, this girlfriend-boyfriend thing. Nothing to do with that. And she just didn't think it was much that night. Interesting to me, just the one thing about Miss Gentile, you know, if you ask me right now, to, to explain to you the phone call that I had three weeks ago with my wife, four weeks ago with my sister, or last week with Mr. West. I can give you the idea, and then my wife would say, well, we talked about dinner. Oh, you're yeah, right, I'm sorry, I went to dinner. No way do you have the recall. But if you're asked to have the recall, tell me what happened. This happened. Did this happen? Didn't he say this? Didn't he say that? Well, he didn't say, what are you talking about? He said, what are you doing here, right? Oh, yeah. You want that, too? Yeah. Ms. Gentile didn't want to be here. And I am, I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm asking for sympathy. I'm sorry that she had to involve her life in our lives um, in a way that she never wanted to be involved. Unfortunately, she was a witness. And uh, we had to deal with it. And some of her frailties came out in a courtroom on TV that I'm sure she never wanted out. And probably every other witness. You know, witnesses wanted to be anonymous. You know all that. You know that they were concerned. Uh, and she's one of them. Some of the stuff she said was, you know, that it was close to the dad's fiance place. I actually think probably she meant close as compared to the 7-Eleven. Makes more sense. He took him 45 minutes to go from the 7-Eleven home. Probably was just hanging out at some mailbox. I'll show you the map between the two. Um, doesn't make any sense that he was hanging out at the mailbox at Retrieve Circle, but whatever. Um, and heard, why are you following me for? Somebody said, what are you talking about? Then it changed. I think that change occurred because of the way her initial interview was handled by one of the attorneys horribly inappropriate to not get this person to law enforcement. Almost as bad as to have the mom on the couch next to you crying when the state does their first interview of you. Their call, but wow, to do it that way. Of course, she even acknowledged that she was concerned about Miss Martin's feelings, which is why she sort of modified or smoothed over some of the more colorful language and the events that happened, and that's okay. Um, you're supposed to just tell the absolute truth here, but um, I'm not gonna ask a, a um, 
someone like Ms. Gentile to come in and just not acknowledge the sensitivities of why she may have made it sound a bit better when telling the story of her son's passing to Ms. Fulton. Ms. McDonald, T-Mobile Records. Ms. Lauer, interesting about her because she sort of, without knowing about it, she gave you some pretty good information when she talked about this three-part exchange, because she was the one who said it before she had no any idea about it actually happening. And what she said was, yes, somebody said something, you know, blue car, red car, blue car, blue car, red car, blue car, and yeah, it sounded like that, a little agitated, and then the movement down. That's where we got the movement down on the animation, by the way. She said, T intersection, down sort of past me, and then of course John Good says it happened in front. And um, that there was only one person yelling for help. That's significant because there is no evidence, none, to suggest there was more than one person yelling for help. And if so, Mr. Guy will remind you of it if I've forgotten. There's no evidence that more than one person was yelling for help. And she was talking about her knowledge and lack of knowledge about the street signs. Ms. Moore, we talked about, she heard what she heard, and then she saw what she saw. By the time she saw it and ran around, that's what happened. Uh, Greg McKinney, records custodian, John Good. We've talked about him a lot. I think he's a significant state or a significant witness because he watched it for eight to 10 seconds, and he was the basis for the um, animation and the information that came to you through the animation. Manalo, Jonathan Manalo, same thing. Looks like he got his butt beat and staggering to the ground. Ricardo Ayala, SPD, um, the hands under the body. You know, if that is a concern of yours that my client dared to testify in his statement that he took his hands out out of fear for a weapon and that that is contraindicated because Trayvon Martin's hands Look at the picture, by the way. One hand is not really under him, but the other hand seems to be. That that is some inconsistency for which you should impute ill will or hatred or spite. That's absurd. It, and DeMaio, Dr. DeMaio said it was. 10 or 15 seconds of talking or movement or whatever. Not only is it possible, it's probable. Stacey Livington, the EMT who was there, you heard all about the injuries and what she did. Timothy Smith, important because, if you remember him, he was the first one on the scene, took George Zimmerman into custody for his own protection. He was the one who George Zimmerman talked to twice about screaming for help before he knew that there was any 911 call suggesting it. Lindsay Folgate, you know about the medical records and she was the first one to mention MMA style. Hirotaki Nakasone, we know about him, basically he said, can't tell you, can't help you, don't do it, don't even try. Fortunately, we, even the FBI couldn't help us out with that voice. So now it is sort of up to you on that. Dar Singleton, initial activity with him with the interview. And I think what was significant about that was George Zimmerman's response to the Christian issue. Um, and to the fact that she was the first person to tell him that Trayvon Martin had passed away. And the statements are what the statements are. Chris Serino, again, what he stated was, in his opinion, and again, he's the law enforcement officer in charge of the investigation, that there weren't any significant inconsistencies in what he heard from George Zimmerman. Were there some? Yes. Were they significant in his mind? as to what, uh, that they were lies? No, not even when he did the challenge interview. Let's talk about that challenge interview for a second. The state said to you, George Zimmerman knew those video cameras weren't working. So, ha-ha, it wasn't a bluff. It was, again, super cop, knowing everything, and just deciding, I can get away with this. Really? Really. So when Chris Serino, there seems to be a problem with this, I'm going to look at it for a second. Um, Chris Serino said that I lost my train. 
I'm going to catch up in just a second here. Um, what he had said was the inconsistencies did not matter to him and did not change his opinion. And when the confrontation interview occurred, and when George Zimmerman said, thank God there may be a videotape, the state wants you to believe the perfect super cop bluff response because he knows this, because let's not forget, he took a couple of classes a couple of years ago at a community college. Absurd, I would suggest to you, to make a suggestion to you that in that moment, when confronted with the potential of an actual video by Mr. Martin, that my client would do anything other than say, thank God it may be there, and that's not evidence of innocence. <clears throat> Mark Osterman, good buddy, don't think he would lie for his friend, but was the one who testified about the self-defense, and I think you remember his testimony, a little bit animated, but sort of told you all about everything he could about both George Zimmerman that night, that he wrote a book about it, that his story is a little bit different from George's other stories, figure it out and figure out how significant it is and whether or not it suggests second degree or anything. Now, <clears throat> Dr. Rao, I don't know what to say. Minimum of four hits, okay. You see the pictures. If you think George Zimmerman was only hit four times, fine. Um, let's, take, let's take a moment on those four hits. You're going to get the statute, you're going to get the jury instructions, and here's what they're going to tell you about the extent of the injuries that you have to find my client suffered at the time he decided to shoot. The significance of those injuries, how life-threatening those injuries were, how soon my client presumed he was going to die from the injuries that were already inflicted upon him. Are you ready? Zero. Zero. No injuries necessary to respond with deadly force. Not a cut on a finger. The statute is clear. Reasonable fear of bodily harm. Captain Carter told you, whoa, whoa, you can get reasonable fear of bodily harm when you're already getting your butt beat. That's certainly an indication. But do you need a cut on your finger? No. Of course, getting a cut on your finger doesn't allow you to just shoot somebody unless you're in reasonable fear for ongoing great bodily injury. So the injuries, icing on the cake of self-defense has nothing to do with the substance of self-defense. Not a thing. You will not hear a word about inflicted injuries. You will only hear that you must look at George Zimmerman's state of mind when he did what he did. So even if I said to you, I'll take Dr. Rao's testimony, though you can tell I wasn't taking Dr. Rao. But let's just say I was. It doesn't matter. Ms. Benson, print expert, there wasn't a lot. Absence of prints doesn't mean no fingerprints or no touching, just that it's not there. Environmental factors such as rain could remove them. Lieutenant Scott Kearns, the application that was denied because my God, Mr. Zimmerman didn't have good credit. Captain Carter, criminal litigation coursework, he actually turned out to be a good expert to tell you what self-defense is and how uh, getting your butt beat um, is really probably a good indication that great bodily injury is coming because um, it's already started. And he says, not a good idea to wait until it actually, you get attacked. Jim Krasinski, records custodian, Gordon Pleasance, we talked about it, taught the course online to Mr. Zimmerman. Amy Seward, uh, firearms. Uh, she mentioned the full round of bullets, full complement of bullets, and I think we had good testimony about that. Anthony Gargone of uh, FDLE talking about DNA. You know, the problem with part of that DNA, they got some. I think they missed a bunch, or at least some, because of the way it was packaged. Significant, 
But I don't know. Uh, I don't think it was that significant. There may have been more blood. I don't think that George Zimmerman was bleeding a lot that night. I don't think he was bleeding a lot out that night. I think he was probably bleeding a fair amount in. And then when he stood up after the attack was over, yes, it started coming out of his nose. Not a lot of blood on Trayvon Martin. Probably not a lot to be expected. Um, and there was no injuries on Trayvon Martin until the gunshot, so you wouldn't imagine there would be any blood on George, um, George I'm sorry, George Zimmerman's <coughs> hands or any place else in his body because when Trayvon Martin was finally shot, he went up and over. So DNA, I, I, we can go over some particulars about it, and I have some, some, some precise points about um, what was found on Mr. Zip, Mr. Trayvon Martin's um, cuffs and whatnot, but generally speaking, not a lot significant. Ms. Fulton, people asked why I even questioned her. How dare you question the mom of a passed away 17-year-old? Doctors cut people sometimes when they do their work, and that was something that I had to present to you to something about the way it happened and how it happened, and you know, the impact and just how moms think about these things, both sides. Because I know that both moms believe with their heart and with their soul that that was their son screaming for help. You have to, and you want to, and it's just the way you get through it. DeVaris Fulton, the brother, he really didn't know. I think he told you in his testimony when he was talking to the uh, NBC affiliate, yeah, it could have been him, not certain, might have been, I think it was. And now he's more certain. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with people wanting to hear what they want to hear. Mr. Bao, Dr. Bao, that was the state's decision to bring him before you as a medical examiner. Not really, it's actually their decision. He was the one who did the autopsy. So, although there was some interaction there that might have best been just redone, the reality is the only injuries were the injuries that we know about on Trayvon Martin, and that the, clo the wet clothes should not have been should not have been bagged in in paper and that the hands should have been bagged. And we'll talk about the hands in a, in a little bit. Miss Zimmerman told you that it was her son, as I'm sure you expected before she ever got on the stand. Um, Jorge Mesa, interesting, because that was unplanned by him, it would seem, if you believe his testimony, sitting at a computer listening and then hearing in the background a voice that he knew without question and immediately to be that of his nephew George Zimmerman. I think he came across very credibly. I think he came across a man of his oath and of his word. And I would ask you to consider the testimony in that regard. Mark Osterman, buddy of his, talked about the weapon use, how you holster a gun. Yeah. He's good at what he does. He was helping George figure out how to fire a gun. Sandra Osterman, friend, Definitely George Zimmerman screamed for help and explained away some of what the state was trying to prove to you through the non-emergency call about the anger and hatred and all that that just isn't there. Same thing with Miss Jerry Russo, no question in her mind, George's voice. Same thing with Leanne Benjamin, has heard him scream and yell in campaigns and that was George Zimmerman. John Donnelly was interesting because I'm not sure that I could, if I had thought about trying to figure out who in the world talks to people they know and then hears them scream for their life. I, I just, there's no profession that does that. Um, maybe a corner man in a boxing ring, but they don't scream for help there. Um, a medic in Vietnam, a person who hangs out during the day with his buddies of 60 to 100 people, figures out who they are, what they are, who they left behind at home, when they want to go back, when they might go back, and when, you know what, that they might never go back. 
because he's the guy who grabs a medic bag and the rifle, I think he said, and hands out towards the screens. And that even before he gets there, sometimes, he knows who it is who's screaming. Wow. Didn't want to testify. I, I don't think the, a guy who's been in Vietnam wants to come before people and break down a little bit. But I think that his testimony was quite credible when he believed it was Mr. Zimmerman. Doris Singleton and, by the way, Chris Serino both say the same thing. Unfortunately, when Mr. Martin did first hear the tape, he said what he believed to be true then, it would seem from the officers, and that is, that's not my son's voice. It just wasn't his voice to him, and his mind has changed now. But it is interesting for you to consider when you're trying to figure out that issue of who said what and what witnesses said what, because you're going to give them credibility, you're going to weigh them, you're going to decide to dismiss their testimony or to accept their testimony, and try and figure out, remembering always, as we'll talk about in a moment, the benefit always goes, or the doubt always goes to my client's benefit. Adam Pollock, animated, good guy. George is soft. He's a one. I don't care that he's been here for a year. I'm not sure I would have actually advertised that I trained George Zimmerman for a year and brought him from a 0 0.5 to a one, but he did. Not a fighter, and I got off a bag. So this MMA, MMA, you know, George, I think the statement said it was 18 months, that George was MMA training three days a week. Arr. Really? Come on. Really? In light of the testimony of the trainer who said, I wouldn't even let him do anything but shadow box for fear the shadow might win, and hit a bag. Tracy Martin we talked about. Chief Bill Lee, he was there for the whole part of it, but most importantly, he was the officer who said, whatever you do, separate them. Don't infect witness testimony with other witness testimony. It is COP 101. I understand the sensitivities of them being family members listening to the possible voice of their son and definitely the gunshot that ended their son's life, but law enforcement, ongoing investigation, just put them in one at a time. They, the way it was handled infected the evaluation of that testimony horribly. And who gets the benefit of that? Joy Zimmerman. Vincent DeMaio, just the grandfather, uh, he's done this his whole life, came in and gave me some really good information about everything having to do with gunshots. Really good because he failed and refused to go beyond gunshots, even when I think we tried to take him a little bit and he said no. And then the state tried to take him a little bit and said, no, I'm good at what I'm good at, but I'm only going to talk about what I'm good at. And what he's good at is gunshot wounds and suggesting that it made perfect sense that the can in the jacket would do what it did. Uh, does it make anything less than perfect sense as to what happened? It's in there, and he's leaning over. And his loose, billowing shirt falls forward. And he gets shot. And it's contact to the fabric. It is not pressed against the chest. I think that little play in opening statement has been dismissed. And it was four inches from his chest. As it turns out, the type of forensic evidence is fairly significant because it completely supports the contention that Mr. Zimmerman was on the bottom, Trayvon Martin leaning over the top when he got shot. Now, here's a theory of guilt for you. You ready? Because this is the state's presentation, so listen carefully. He might have been backing up. He could have been backing up. Could have been. If I was arguing that, I would be arguing to you reasonable doubt. You know, it could have happened this way. It could have been that he was backing up. Well, I don't know. 
I, I, I almost made light of it when I said, well, they could have been backing up to strike another blow. But the could have beens don't belong in this courtroom. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt, consistent with a reasonable hypothesis of innocence, he was leaning over him. Nothing to suggest anything else but that. He could have been leaning back. At some point after 45 seconds of attacking George Zimmerman, for no other reason, let's not forget, he didn't back up when John Good told him to, right? So for some reason, just before the shot takes off, at that moment, the state wants you to believe Trayvon Martin retreated. Really? Really? One piece of evidence, just one I asked for, just one piece of evidence that supports that contention. Where is it? Where's the eyewitness who said, I saw him back up? Where's the, where's the forensic evidence? Where he got all the way back up, chest and shirt are tied together and shot is through and through. Where's that piece of evidence? Where is one shred of evidence to support the absurdity that they're trying to have you buy? One. Mr. Guy can tell you about it when he closes, if it's there. Assumption, supposition, could have been. Thrown apart, just part of the absurdity of how this thing happened with the phone call, uh, with the tape. I don't think it matters too much. Ms. Dillegard, nice lady, didn't want to bring her here sick. Knows George Zimmerman, saw him that night, saw him beat up, saw the picture, or hit, I'm sorry, saw him hit. And that he has a light voice, and it sounded like it was his voice. Dennis Root, you know, it's interesting. Again, talk about the Bizarro case. Now we have prosecutors attacking, <laughs> sort of impeaching. Um, lifetime law enforcement officers who have dedicated their life to the pursuit of perfection in law enforcement. Perfection. My God, he's trained in everything. He takes something on, he becomes a trainer. And now we have the state impeaching. Well, hold on a second here. Could have been this way, right? Mm, not really. Well, let me ask you this question, Mr. Guy says. At that moment, George Zimmerman decided to shoot Trayvon Martin. What other options did he have? None. He had none from a use of force expert who's been doing this his entire career and who has become proficient in assisting others in learning how to use force, learning how not to use force, learning when and when to use force. And they asked him the question, of whether or not George Zimmerman had alternatives. Tell me the piece of evidence that contraindicates that. Just give me one. Give me a shred of evidence that contradicts that he had any other option. Because now we have an expert who's qualified who gave you that opinion. Dismiss it if you want, the judge will tell you. Just because you're experts doesn't mean it's gospel, that you have to listen to them. But if you believe them, if you think they're well qualified enough to give an opinion, if it's an area of inquiry which will help you, then accept it. Ms. Bertillon, I hope, I hope it does not come across that I was just seeking sympathy for this woman. But the reality is, I think when you put a face on what was happening at Retreat View, she's it. She really is. Chris, thank God nobody came upstairs. I'm not sure the scissors would have really helped. But that's the face. And I'll tell you this, I'll give you this much. 
that's the face of the frustration that I think George was feeling a little bit of, you know? That's something that he wanted to help out with. That's why he walked over and didn't say, I'm going to go this way. No. That's why he said, here's a lock for the back of your door. Here's my telephone number. And here's my wife's number. You need our help? This is what we do. We help. Dad, you know, he said it early. You got to give it this much. He said it right away. He went down to SPD to talk to them, Sanford Police Department. They put him under oath. Or maybe, I'm sorry, maybe the state attorney's office. They put him under oath and said, okay, now, you're under oath. You got to tell the truth. Is that your son? Yes. We, um, Talk about a few other points, if I might. Oops. Because this is not working. It might come back. If not, I'll just read it to you. If there's any chance it'll come back up, that'd be great. If not, I'll just work without it. Some of the things that you want to consider when you look at this case is the forensic evidence, what it does and doesn't support. Here was an interesting thing that I didn't make a big deal about in the trial, but I want you to focus on because a lot has been said about the lack of blood and what happened to the blood, and well, if Trayvon Martin was doing what George Zimmerman says Trayvon Martin was doing, where's the blood, where's the anger, where does it show up on the hands? Um, State 28. Gunshot wound. See the blood trickling down and across the chest. See that? three-inch swath of blood all the way over there. It's 895. It's gone. Not there. Yet, everybody who handled that body said they didn't touch it or they didn't wipe it. They may say, well, well that was when we moved the sweatshirt up and we moved it back down and the blood is all gone, but let's not forget the blood was there after they moved the sweatshirt up, so why wasn't it there if they moved the blood down? And it was actually still losing in this photograph. So, oh, some big moment. I proved my case. No. But the idea that they want you to assume, that they want you to believe, just connect the dots that there was no blood because there was no blood when they failed to properly preserve items like the sweatshirts, items like the body, it seems, items like the hands that were to be bagged but weren't. They don't have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they bagged the hands. That's not an element they have to prove. But if they're going to try and come up with conclusive evidence that supports no other reasonable hypothesis of innocence but guilt, then they have to have a better case. And this is just some evidence of it. So let's talk about other things you have to consider about that event. A couple of graphics. George Zimmerman, the way he was. Trayvon Martin the way he was. Now let's do it life size.
Trayvon Martin that night. He was wearing shoes, I have to show you. He had the hoodie on, on top of the hoodie. This is from the picture that we showed you. It's not in evidence, just to have you look at it. Don't even have to believe it's accurate. Just take a look at it. Remember how much taller I was than Andrew Gall when I was standing next to him, and he testified that he was five foot 10. And then there's George Zimmerman, and how tall he is. Take a look at him compared to my eye height. what you have to look at and determine in a self-defense case. So, you look at this guy that night, don't look at him today, there's been testimony all over the place as to how much weight he gained, it doesn't really matter, what matters is how he looked that day, and how Trayvon Martin looked that day. The other thing that's in evidence, just so you get a clue, or not a clue, an indication, November 15th, 2011, about two months, three months before Trayvon Martin passed away. That's what he looked like. He's a young kid, nice kid, actually, if you look at the picture, not bad. The problem with it is that when we show you autopsy photographs, there are two things you need to know about autopsy photographs. One, they're horrific, and they're meant to have negative impact. I did it when I was a prosecutor, prosecutors do all the time. A dead person on a slab has an impact on you. I, I would say that maybe one of you, maybe, have looked at a picture like that before this trial. Maybe one. It has an impact. The other thing about autopsy photographs is that there's no muscle tone because there's no nerves, there's no movement. He lost half his blood, we know that. So on that picture, that we have of him on the medical examiner's table, yeah, he does look emaciated. But here's him three months before that night. So it's in evidence. Take a look at it. Because this is the person, and this is the person who George Zimmerman encountered that night. This is the person who, from all of the evidence, was attacked, or attacked George Zimmerman, broke his nose or something close to it, and battered him on something. And the state now may say, oh, maybe it was just a drain box, and it was no intent to hurt there by Tray Trayvon Martin, because it was just coincidence that he was bashing his head on hard, something hard, and it was a drain box. Really? Come on. Really? Those injuries? You know how Doctor was out that night? You've seen this before. It was out of this darkness that Trayvon Martin decided to stalk, I guess, plan, pounce, I don't know. All I know is that when George Zimmerman is walking back to his car, out of the darkness, be it bushes, or darkness, or left, or behind, or somewhere, Trayvon Martin came towards George Zimmerman. Out of this. And we know what happened. The big picture is what happened. And it's supported by evidence. You know, we talked a moment ago about ignoring George's statements. You know what? Don't ignore them. Listen to them. Find the inconsistencies in them. See what you think about them. Take them in context of what he was going through that night and how voluntary he gave all of those statements. And decide whether or not, as Dennis Root said, as Chris Serino said, as I believe Singleton said, if anyone is giving me the same exact story twice, 
they're probably lying. They're probably pathological liars. Because when you lie, I guess, since you're making up a fantasy, you can tell the fantasy twice, the same exact way. But if you get your nose smashed or your head smashed and you're trying to do what you can, and you're asking, answering every question they ask of you, then yeah, okay. Deal with the inconsistencies however you want to. But maybe I would suggest you begin by dealing with them the way Chris Serino did, since it was his case. And what he said to you was, yeah, there's some consistencies. Yeah. He said he got hit 25 times. Nah, I don't believe it. I, it seems he didn't get hit 25 times. Did it feel like he was getting hit 25 times? Maybe. Is that the embellishment, the exaggeration the state is talking about when they say to you, oh, he's exaggerating, he's a liar. He's a liar? Really? Come on. Those are lies. If you lie, it's normally with intent to deceive, isn't it? Isn't that the essence of a lie? If George Zimmerman had the intent to deceive, why would he give six statements? If you're going to give him credit for anything about going to school and going through legal studies, here's one, Miranda. He knows self-defense. He knows stand your ground. He knows whatever the state wants you to think he knows, but he doesn't know Miranda. Oh, no, no, no. He knows Miranda, but he was such the mastermind that he could, without knowing any of the evidence, who was watching, who was videotaping, who was doing anything, without knowing any of that, he had it all sussed. He had it all figured out, really. It defies explanation. It doesn't defy explanation of things like this. The mud on the knees, evidencing the mounting. What doesn't defy explanation is Tim Smith, Officer Tim Smith's testimony that George Zimmerman's back was wet, more wet than the front, and they had grass all over his back, evidencing, I would opine, that he was on his back in the grass, and he was getting beat up. Manalo, Tim Smith, Wagner, everybody else who saw those injuries. Okay. You don't get graphic, but you do still get me going over some of the instructions with you. Reasonable doubt. What is it? Can't tell you any more than we have. The judge has read it to you a couple of times already. You're going to get it again. Reasonable doubt. Don't start with the premise. Presumption of innocence sticks and stays until it is taken away by evidence that convinces you beyond a reasonable doubt that it is no longer appropriate to consider Mrs. Zimmerman innocent. Then and only then do you get to convict my client anything. A reasonable doubt is not a mere possible doubt. If you've got to make it up, that's not a reasonable doubt. We talked about me proving my case as though I had to. Um, it's not a speculative doubt or an imaginary doubt or a forced doubt. If you have a doubt and, and you say to yourself, you know, I don't buy this doubt, but I'm going to force myself to believe it, that would be a forced doubt and isn't reasonable. But a reasonable doubt is not a mere possible doubt, speculative, imaginary, or forced doubt. Such a doubt must not influence you to return a verdict of not guilty. If you have an abiding conviction of guilt, on the other hand, and this is where, this is the meat of it, if after carefully considering, comparing, and weighing all the evidence, there is not an abiding conviction of guilt or of having that conviction, it is one which is not stable, one which wavers and vacillates. Then the charge is not proved beyond a reasonable doubt, every reasonable doubt, and you must find George Zimmerman not guilty because the doubt is reasonable. 
I almost wish, and I've never said this in a criminal trial before, I never heard it being said before, I almost wish that the verdict had guilty, not guilty, and completely innocent. Because I would ask you to check for that one. You've got to check the not guilty. But check the innocent then, too. The reasonable doubt as to George Zimmerman's innocence may arise from the evidence, conflict in the evidence, or a lack of evidence. If you have a reasonable, if you have no reasonable, if you have a reasonable doubt, you should find George Zimmerman not guilty. If you have absolute, if you have no reasonable doubt, you should find George Zimmerman guilty. Weighing the evidence, you'll have all this before you. Should, Judge Nelson's going to read it to you, and she's going to give it to you. But just to focus on what you do about these witnesses, whether the question is whether or not they had the opportunity to see and know the things they're telling you about, obviously. And that's that vantage point concern, how they really can look at it. The perception you have to see. For example, if somebody came in, wasted off their mind, then give them less credibility. We don't have that here, but you've got to look at it and decide whether or not they had an opportunity to see what they're talking about. Do they have an accurate memory? And we know that memory is affected by traumatic events. I think Ms. Sudaika is a good example of that. She was frantic about what she perceived was happening outside. Um, and I think it may well have impacted on her ability to recall, not calling her anything but a person affected by the circumstances. Were they honest and straightforward? I would put up on that pedestal Ms. Bahador. Your call, but as to whether or not she presented in a way that made some sense. Compare her to Ms. Mora, who just seemed to be saying what she remembered and very willing to show you. Did they have an interest in the outcome? Well, let me tell you something. When George Zimmerman gave those statements to law enforcement, he didn't know it, I don't think. Didn't seem normal that he would have ever been charged in this case, but in his mind at that time, I presume you could say that he had an interest in telling the story as good he could for himself. So, sure. Was there an interest in the outcome? Absolutely. These people trying to take away his liberty? Absolutely. Consider that when you look at those statements as well. And um, does the witness's testimony agree with other testimony? That's the, that's the global view. Dennis Root kept saying to you, well, you have to look at it in the totality of the circumstances. Don't just give me one sheet and go, well, what do you think now? I want to read everything I can. That's the same thing. That's that totality of the circumstances. Um, so rules for you to deliberate under, and here they are. The case must be decided upon the evidence, so it makes sense. But that was the, I started, I don't know, oh, two and a half, three hours ago, I started with the idea that you need to be very careful not to do the assumptions that you might otherwise do at the state's request. It is only the evidence and the witnesses that you can look towards for that. Um, upon the evidence that you've heard from the testimony of the witnesses and have seen in the form of exhibits, all that really means to you is, though you can bring your common sense, don't bring your assumptions, don't bring your presumptions, and don't sit back and just go, I really think that guy's not going to cut in front of me as I drive to work today. You don't have that luxury in a criminal courtroom. You don't. You only get to decide upon what you are certain of something that you do not have a reasonable doubt about. Don't do it because you feel sorry for anyone. Now I said to you, and you may not have realized, I think you realized why, but the significance of it now comes back home. I said to you, you know, if the state doesn't prove their case, you can be able to say something to announce a verdict of acquittal, even though that verdict has to be heard by the Martin family, and you said you could. I, I meant that for a very significant reason. It is a tragedy, truly. But you can't allow sympathy to feed into it. When I say that to you, you should sit back, someone should raise their hand and go, are you nuts? How dare you tell me to leave sympathy out of my life? How dare you tell me to leave all of my emotions 
Besides, how dare you? I don't do that ever in my life. Welcome to a criminal courtroom, because unfortunately you have to be better than your presumptions. You have to be better than what you do in everyday life. Better, at least different, at least unique. Verdict should not be influenced by feelings of prejudice, bias, or sympathy. It must be based on the evidence in the law, period. And the judge will tell you what the law is. And now we have to talk for a moment about self-defense. Because we've talked all around it, and let's tell you exactly what the judge will instruct you as to what it is. A person is justified in using deadly force, force likely to cause death, if he reasonably believes that such force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself. There are alternatives, death or great bodily harm, so I'm going to go through this and tell you that you, what you need to consider is whether or not George reasonably believed, reasonable fear of great bodily harm. He doesn't have to think he was going to die. He does not have to think he was going to die. He does have to think that he was going to be injured greatly. And since the alternative, if either matches, it's been met. In deciding whether or not George Zimmerman was justified in using deadly force, you must judge him by the circumstances which he was surrounded with at the time the force was used. The moment of using the force, what was happening? The danger facing George Zimmerman need not have been actual. Now. Getting beat up sort of takes that better in context, but it doesn't have to be actual. In effect, I guess, the knife coming at you could be rubber, as long as you perceive it to be steel. Or the next blow of a fist could be a fake one, but as long as you perceive it to continue to be blow down, down upon blow down upon you, then that's enough. The danger that George Zimmerman faced need not have been actual. However, to justify the use of deadly force, the appearance of danger must have been so real that a reasonably cautious and prudent person, under those circumstances, reasonably prudent and cautious person, under those circumstances, you've got to put yourself in effect in the mind of what George Zimmerman was going through, the circumstances that he was going through, and then decide yourself whether or not that what a reasonably and cautious person under those circumstances would have believed the danger could only be avoided through the use of that force. Based upon appearances, George Zimmerman must have actually believed the danger was real. And considering self-defense, and again it's called justifiable use of deadly force, we shorthand it to self-defense, you may take into account the relative physical abilities and capacities of George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin. If your consideration of the issue of self-defense, you have a reasonable doubt on the question of whether George Zimmerman was justified in the use of deadly force, you should find George Zimmerman not guilty. And let me show you what that means in layman's terms, because I don't like the fact that I'm trying to prove to you a double negative just seems awkward. If you have a reasonable doubt on the question of whether or not George Zimmerman was justified in the use of deadly force, you have a reasonable doubt as to whether or not he was justified in the use of deadly force. He's not guilty. Anywhere along this graph, anywhere along this graph, if you believe, this is where I went a little while ago, anywhere along this graph, then he's not guilty. That's why I said this was the bizarro case of showing a case like this and wondering whether or not there is a reasonable doubt as to, the, as to whether or not he had to use that deadly force 
to protect himself from great bodily harm. The other thing that I think we've probably gotten past, but I want to be clear about, is this one. You're going to get all the law that applies in this case. Every shred of law that applies to this case, you will have before you. What you won't have is any law that suggests something like following somebody is illegal, because it's not. Following somebody in the car or on foot in order to report their whereabouts to the police is not unlawful activity under Florida law. If it was, you would be instructed on it. You would have a statute as part of your jury instructions that says something that George Zimmerman did was unlawful. And you wouldn't have it because it's just not there, because it's just not true. I'm over my time. I'm going to finish up quicker than I would like to. I cannot imagine that I've actually been here for three hours. But I want to do a couple of quick things to show you, since this is the state's burden, what they haven't proven about it. I don't think it's a big deal that they decide not to give you the sixth emergency or non-emergency call. I just, you know, they should have, just to be complete. But whatever. I don't know, you know, the fact that I had to call Tracy Martin to have him testify to that when it's the state's case, I guess that they didn't have to do that. But if you're really seeking justice, why have me do it? Why not even have Serena testify? Why did I have to have him testify that Tracy Martin said it wasn't his son? Why did I have to have Singleton testify? Certainly they're available to me, and I did it. And I guess if, it's, if I can do it, the state doesn't have to, except, you know, it really and always will be their burden, not mine. They didn't tell you about all the other burglaries that happened at Retreat Pew. I did. They're there. I haven't highlighted them, but trust me, they're there. Where's the expert countering use of force? Where's their guy? So all we have on use of force now is Dennis Root. Again, they don't have to bring a use of force expert. I did. They don't have to. But if that's their issue, where's their information? Same thing with Dr. DeMaio. I guess they sort of had Dr. Rao. Well, no, not on gunshot. But where's that? Again, they don't have to, but this is their case. I mean, it affects George Zimmerman, but it's their prosecution. It's their burden. that he pushed the, sh the uh, gun into Tra Trayvon Martin's chest. You know, justice and emotions, you gotta be careful with it, because we all have emotions as human beings, and then we have justice. And you sit back and you go, what are they trying to do? Does it really help you decide this case when somebody who is not George Zimmerman's voice screams at you or yells at you and curses at you? No. I would contend. Listen to the tape. Don't listen to Mr. Guy. I'm sure people say that I, I look like Joel Osteen, and I think Mr. Guy is trying to sound like him with his really long effing punks. You know, do we need that? I, I, I do a little bit, I guess. But do we need that type of anger coming out from a prosecutor rather than from a defendant? Is that really the way we're going to? Present this case to a jury of my client's peers? Assholes. Really? Is that the way he said it? One piece of evidence that my client attacked Trayvon Martin. Landed one blow, for that matter. Did anything to justify in any form or fashion the onslaught of injury perpetrated upon him by no one other than Trayvon Martin. He actually had something else because Joe Zimmerman was in fact on with a firearm and we know that. We know he had the right to have it. And then it was said, how many times was it said now, I'll be held in contempt if I drop this. 
so I'm not going to do some drama and drop it on the floor and watch it roll around. But that's cement. That is a sidewalk. And that is not an unarmed teenager with nothing but Skittles trying to get home. That was somebody who used the availability of dangerous items from his fist to the concrete to cause great bodily injury. Not that it's necessary for self-defense, but great bodily injury against George Zimmerman. And the suggestion by the state that that's not a weapon, that that can't hurt somebody, that that can't cause great bodily injury is disgusting. Even if we presume Rachel Gentile was completely accurate in whichever version of what she first heard happen, you want to believe. <clears throat> what she said was that George Zimmerman said, what are you doing around here? Let's just for a moment presume that we had that on audio tape. Let's just say they were recording their phone call and you heard her voice. Oh, you heard George's, George Zimmerman's voice on the tape that said, what are you doing around here? What did, well, what did Mr. Root say about that? What did the only expert that talks about the evolution of force tell us? Well, you say something like that, I might say, whatever I want, or who are you to ask, or what do you mean? or get out of my face. But Dennis Root didn't say that the appropriate response is to break somebody's nose. Did he? Did he suggest that that was even near the spectrum of violence allowed, or the spectrum of force allowed in a situation like that? Unfortunately, you know, there was some anger and hostility and ill will and spite maybe that night. It just had nothing to do with George Zimmerman. Well, that's not true. It had something to do with George Zimmerman. He was the victim of it. Because you can't look at those pictures and say that what was visited upon George Zimmerman was not evidence of ill will, spite, and hatred. Had Trayvon Martin been shot through the hip and survived, what do you think he would have been charged with? Aggravated battery, two counts. <coughs> the state has to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt, you have no doubt in your mind that my client is guilty of anything. I really, you get trial hypnosis. You think that you say the right things whenever you talk as a lawyer. So within that context, I really feel like I may have convinced you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mrs. Zimmerman is innocent. But of course we know that has nothing to do with it. State will get up and finish in just a couple of minutes and they will tell you he's a liar again. Maybe not because Mr. Delrion has spent most of his time convincing you that my client lied. Um, but here is the standard. You go back there. First thing you might want to consider doing, do you have a reasonable doubt that my client may have acted in self-defense? Go back there and say to yourselves, let's just talk, about, forget the crimes, let's just talk about self-defense. Do we think he might have acted in self-defense? Not, not convinced. I have some doubt, I have some concern that he just may have acted in self-defense. And if you reach that conclusion, you get to stop. You really do. Why? 
because self-defense is a defense to everything, to littering, to speeding, to battery, if it mattered, to grand theft, to assault, to manslaughter, to second degree. You go no further than a determination that the state, now that we're done and there is no more evidence, that the state has not convinced you beyond a reasonable doubt that George Zimmerman did not act in self-defense. It's an easy decision. And I don't say that out of hubris or just ego, ha ha ha. I'm saying it because of the facts of the case. You look at these facts, you look at all this evidence, and you have to say, I have a reasonable doubt <laughs> as to whether or not the state convinced me he didn't act in self-defense. That's, that's all you have to do. Don't, you don't have to write innocent on the bottom of the verdict form. We don't go anywhere near those in this courtroom. The state never, ever loses their responsibility to take away reasonable doubt from you. Don't let them do it with innuendo. Don't let them do it with sympathy. Don't let them do it with yelling. Don't let them do it with screeching. Because none of that matters. Because we have a definition of reasonable doubt, and now you do. You look at that definition, you go back to that room and say, let's talk first about self-defense. If I think George may have acted in self-defense, we are done. So, <sighs> thank you for the time. Thank you for the attention. Um, again, we talked about it way in the beginning, uh, an amazingly difficult task that we've asked you to take on. Um, and, and we all have had juries who, a couple of whom we had to wake up on occasion is certainly not those. Um, the the note-taking, the interest, uh, it's been apparent. Um, I appreciate the time my client does, the state does, I'm sure, the court does, and Seminole County does because you've given us what we needed from you, which is your attention. I want one more thing from you. I want you to really, really look at those instructions, apply them, and just say he acted in self-defense, find him not guilty, let him go back and get back to his life. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Romero. Ladies and gentlemen, do you want a brief break before um, Mr. Guy gets some? Let's go ahead and take a 10 minute recess. Please follow Deputy Jarvis back into the jury room. Put your notebooks pads face down. Be seated, we'll be in recess for 10 minutes. 